So the discussion point is how I treat a patient with low risk MDS show, showing signs of ESA failure. Actually, I will extend this a little bit more to um, so to do to, uh, to the ESA treatment and and the relevance of ESA treatment in uh, in this era when we have new effective drugs. So on the agenda, have, we have uh, so uh, more or less in the introduction of the discussion is the, what is the optimal timing of ESA treatment. Uh, the, and then we go to the uh, the importance of second line treatment following signs of ESA failure, and uh, treatment options after ESA failure, including uh, the spatocept, and then the optimal time to switch a patient to an alternative treatment such as the spatocept, or should we use the spatocept in the first line? Next, next. So at the same time as the uh, official. Uh, uh, the most important uh, publication on the uh, impact of Lispatocept in 2020 by uh, uh, by a large group and uh, Pierre as, as the first author, um, we have written down the experience of the EU MDS registry and uh, in a perspective article on the novel dyna dynamic outcome indicators and clinical endpoints in MDS. Myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS. Can you move forward? And so this is the uh, diagram of this uh, the, this publication. And what you see here um, at the right upper part is the clinical uh, management of the patients. And what you at that time point, the only effective uh, treatment intervention uh, in lower risk MDS was ESA. So what you see here is uh, the response of ESA um, um, is better than in, 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 in when you give ESA to un untransfused patients because there is a delay of uh, starting uh, uh, the blood, red blood cell transfusion compared to the control group of more than six months uh, to the, the control group who didn't receive ESA in the uh, uh, anemic period. Um, and uh, uh, if, if there is no response to ESA, then the, the patients become red blood cell transfusion dependent and receive iron chelation. Also, iron chelation will result in a response in, in, uh, in, in about 10 to 30 percent of the patients with a uh, transfusion free survival or an improved survival. Uh, improved hematopoiesis, uh, but also uh, a decrease of the transfusion dependency and a better quality of life. So, in fact, we have, before the introduction of the new drugs, we have two drugs which are relevant for uh, uh, transfusion-dependent patients or anemic MDS patients, and which is ESA and iron transition. Next slide. So here you see, you, you may remember we have uh, described the uh, impact of ESA treatment uh, in, 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 a public, in a study published about seven years ago, but this is a second study, a follow-up study, where we looked at the impact of uh, uh, ESA in low-risk MDS um, according to the status of the uh, transfusion sta uh, status prior to starting ESA. And what you see here, is that if you start ESA, this is the blue line, if you start ESA before the uh, uh, introduction of uh, red blood cell transfusions, then the overall outcome, overall survival of patients is much better than patients who uh, started ESA treatment um, uh, in a, a, uh, when they had, an, uh, let's say, an, a, a very low uh, 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 intensity of uh, blood, red blood cell transfusions uh, compared and, and 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 also in a higher uh, in the group is the high high level high level of transfusions, but there is no major difference between these two groups, indicating that receiving trans transfusions before the start of ESA is uh, is a negative uh, predictor of uh, response to the, uh, sorry, uh, to survival response to ESA. Next slide. 
And here you see what happens in these patients. So uh, we subdivided the patients uh, over time according to the uh, ESA status and the transfusion status. So the upper group you see are the patients who did not receive uh, uh, red blood cell transfusions uh, and, and, and no ESA. And you see that this group is gradually uh, um, uh, becoming transfusion dependent and receives ESA. So the second group is, are patients who receive ESA treatment before red blood cell transfusions over time. You can see the numbers uh, increase over time and switch from one point to another at the six months intervals. The third group are the patients who received ESA uh, after uh, in patients who, who are already transfusion dependent and in the uh, lower curve, you see patients who were through transfusion dependent and did not receive treatment with ESA. Next slide. So what you see in these patients, uh, so I, I didn't, I'm not going to show you the survival curves of these patients because, uh, but I would like to focus on quality of life in these patients. So these four groups, the untransfused, uh, uh, non-treated uh, group uh, and in the upper curve, you see that the uh, quality of life in these patients, the EQ5D index is higher in the untransfused, untreated patients. But the patients who received ESA um, before becoming transfusion dependent, you see that these patients um, the quality of life returns to the normal levels of untransfused patients with MDS. And that uh, remains stable uh, or at least better than, uh, than the patients who were treated with ESA, uh, uh, who were transfusion dependent, and the patients who uh, were transfusion dependent over time. You see a gra gradual decrease of the quality of life of these patients. So we have to consider that in this, these patients who have a general uh, overall survival of around five years, the lower risk patients. Next slide. So I will discuss with you the, 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 the uh, uh, relevant study for the Dispatoset uh, um, uh, treatment of our patients, and this is the medalist study uh, uh, coordinated by uh, by uh, Pierre Fano. So we all know this this study. I suppose it's a double blind placebo controlled phase three trial, uh, which uh, uh, randomly assigned uh, assigned uh, transfused patients with ring citroblast or lower risk MDS patients according to IPSSR. And they were randomized for either the spatocep or placebo in a, a two to one uh, uh, two to one incidence. Uh, the primary endpoint of this study was transfusion independence for eight weeks or longer do, during the first twenty four the weeks of treatment, and the secondary endpoint was the transfusion independence for twelve weeks or longer uh, during uh, either twenty four weeks or uh, 48 weeks. I'm not going into the details. Um, so the transfusion independence for eight weeks or longer was observed in 38 of the patients with the, in the Lispatocept group compared to 30% of the patients in the placebo group, very significant, and a higher percentage of patients in the Lispatocept group uh, than in the placebo group met the uh, key secondary endpoints, 28 versus 8 percent for weeks one to for 24. Next slide. Here you see this in the in the in the uh, in the graph in the picture uh, from this study. So you, the percentage of patients uh, in the spatter cell group becoming uh, 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 having having a response of uh, uh, transfusion independence uh, within the first eight uh, of longer than eight weeks in the first 24 weeks is uh, significantly better than in the control group, 38% versus 13%. Uh, the 12 week response was 28 to 8%, also very significant. And if you extend the uh, observation period for uh, 48 weeks, you see the same kind of difference, very significant. And the response duration 
uh, is generally um, uh, uh, generally uh, it, it, the decline is, is very very little. So it's thirty eight percent here and twelve uh, twenty eight percent in uh, after sixteen weeks uh, uh, of uh, sixty weeks and longer. Next slide. So the increase in hemoglobin levels during uh, this study. Uh, during the first uh, 24 weeks, there was a median increase in hemoglobin level of uh, at least one gram per deciliter in, in 35% of the patients in the Respartisab group and only 8% in the placebo group. And uh, in the, uh, this is the longer duration, this was 41% to 11%. Next slide shows the, uh, what you see, uh, the, the, uh, the overall uh, picture so the uh, mean increase um, of the of the hemoglobin levels over time. Um, this is the control group, and, and here you see the uh, uh, the spatter group. So the difference is very clear, very significant, and also relevant. Next, so uh, in a later publication in a letter to blood uh, from the same group. Um, you can see that also the neutrophil counts uh, improve during the treatment of uh, the spatocep uh, compared to the control group and uh, the platelet counts improve and you can see this over time uh, for the uh, for the uh, neutrophils here and for the uh, uh, platelets there. Next slide. So, in conclusion, from these two studies, the spatocep reduced the severity of anemia in uh, transfusion receiving patients with lower risk MDS uh, and SF3B1 MDS who had a disease that was refractory to or uh, unlikely to respond to e um, or patients who had discontinued uh, uh, such agents owing to adverse events. Serious side events were rare and uh, therefore, the spatocept appears to be superior to alternative interventions such as linolinamide and, and uh, hypermacerating agents. Next slide. The second study which I'd like to discuss with you is, I think, is, is uh, uh, even more interesting. Uh, and this was the COMMAN study, um, which was published uh, a couple of months ago in July in uh, uh, in the Lancet. Uh, probably all of you have uh, know, know the results of this study, but just uh, repeat it in a quick way. So this was an, uh, a, an interim analysis of a phase three open label uh, randomized controlled trial. Um, the eligible patients were had lower risk uh, MDS according to the IPCSR were ESA naive, so they did not receive ESA before, and and uh, uh, the, the, they required uh, a red blood cell transfusion intensity of at least uh, more than two units per eight weeks for eight weeks immediately before the randomization. So these were patients who had a relative intensive transfusion history. The patients were randomly assigned one to one to Lespatacep and EPO and stratified by baseline uh, transfusion burden, EPO levels, and ring blood status. Positive facets, negative. The primary endpoint was red blood, blood cell transfusion independence for at least 12 weeks with a concurrent mean hemoglobin increase of at least 1.5 gram per deciliters. Next slide. So what are the main results of this uh, early uh, uh, observation in this study? So 356 patients were uh, uh, randomized uh, one to one. The interim efficacy analysis was done in, uh, in just about 300 uh, patients who completed uh, 24 weeks of treatment or discontinued earlier. 59% of the patients in the Despatercept group and 31% uh, of the patients in the EPO group reached the primary endpoint. And this was significantly different, this uh, uh, endpoint. So the difference was, uh, the transfusion response rate was 26%. Um, 
De median treatment exposure was longer for patients receiving lispatacept, 42 weeks versus 27 weeks for the EPO. And the median duration of transfusion uh, the independence at, uh, the, uh, lasting at, le at least 12 weeks was longer with lispatacept than uh, EPO, 127 weeks versus 77 weeks. Next slide. Here you see uh, the secondary endpoints of the study. Red blood, blood, red blood cell transfusion independence more than 12 weeks during the first 24 weeks is higher in the dispatacept group compared to the EPO group. And if the, uh, the independence of 24 weeks is higher in the uh, dispatacept group compared to the EPO group, and also the hematological uh, uh, improvement um, was uh, higher in, in the uh, 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 in, in the status group compared to the EPO group. Next slide. So here you see, and I think this is very impor important uh, from this study, you see the impact of the uh, molecular mutations uh, in, uh, in, in this group of patients. And what you see here is um, the effect of both groups, the, so EPO uh, effect uh, to the left and the uh, dispatacept effect to the right. And the, this, this, this line is the average response of all patients. And what you can see here is that especially the SF3B1 patients, they respond very well to uh, um, uh, to to uh, to to the uh, the spatters are better than the uh, EPO group, and uh, but also the ASX one and um, and the TED two the SF uh, patients uh, and the DMT A three A in the presence of SF three B one mutations had a favorable uh, the most favorable outcome compared to the other groups. So there's a, a, a difference in an impact of the, the mutations as we would expect. Next slide. So what is the interpretation of these studies and also the command study? So first of all, the spatters have improved the rate of transfusion independence and increased the hemoglobin levels compared to the EPO, ESA and EVE groups with lower risk MDS. This is very relevant. But this is an interim analysis, so we need long-term follow-up to validate these results and to refine the findings in the various subgroups, as you have shown in the molecular groups, including non-mutated SF3B1 or ring sideroblastic negative patients. I am afraid that the number of these patients in this in the commons group is very low, but, but we will hear about it uh, probably also at the forthcoming ash, I suppose. The number of patients without ring sideroblast or SF3B1 mutation is very small in this study. So additional studies are necessary to provide more insight into the possible effect of the spinal cell compared to the ESA interventions in the less stable group of low-risk uh, MDS patients. And we have to keep in mind that this is 80% of the lower-risk MDS patients. So it's important to realize that uh, RSSF3B1 patients usually have a shorter response to ESAs than the non uh, uh, RSSF3B1 patients. So that's, that's something we have to consider. Next slide. I think this is the last one. So future studies are necessary to validate the impact of Lyspatacept on the health-related quality of life of these patients. This is also taken care of by the command study, but we have not seen the data yet. These findings suggest that the spatters have might change the current treatment landscape by reducing patients' reliance on uh, uh, transfusions and decreasing the transfusion-related uh, morbidities. The effect of ESA treatment is more pronounced in the transfusion-independent anemic patients. So we have to see whether the spatters have may play a role in these patients as well, it's a, 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 more, a more pronounced uh, impact. And it will be interesting to know the impact of Luspatership in this group of non transfused patients. So the combination of ESA and Luspatership um, after Luspatership failure 
has also been explored in a, a small single center study of 28 patients published a few months ago in the uh, blood advances by Comorti from uh, the overall response rate was 36%, 10 out, 10 out of 28 patients with a median duration of response of 17 months. So this is something that we could consider of the patients who have a uh, loss of response after the spat um, and or we should even consider that as an initial uh, uh, start in the patients who are less likely to resp respond to the spatter septal on, but this is something for the future, I suppose. Thank you. I think that's the end. So, are there any comments or questions about this? Yeah. Yes, I, I think just a small point about quality of life. The problem in those trials is that quality of life is generally compared, not in this one, but in most, it's it's compared between uh, treated patients and placebo patients. What you actually should compare is patients who respond to a given treatment to placebo patients, because patients who do not respond, of course, I mean, are transfused. And uh, 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 because this is real life. I mean, it, is a treatment effective? I mean, if, if it is effective, if it, if it reduces the transfusion requirement and improves hemoglobin level, it's probably going to improve quality of life. But in all studies, the, the comparison has been made between treatment and placebo. And, and as the response rate was generally not greater than 50%, the effect on quality of life was diluted uh, by, by the non-responders. And I have never seen one, uh, uh, almost never seen one such study where, where there was a quality of uh, life advantage because there was this bias. So we conclude there's no quality of life. There is one, I mean, because we know quality of life in those patients is very much related to the median hemoglobin level. Yeah, but you are very right. And that's why I, I showed you the, the studies we did in the ESA treated patients yeah, in the UMDS registry, where we looked over time in the responding patients to uh, to and, 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 and see the impact of... Uh, uh, of the intervention in, in the responding patients. Yes, you are right. Any more questions or remarks? So what do you feel about uh, uh, the, um, the possibility of replacing the initial uh, intervention ESA uh, to the new drugs like, uh, like the Sparta said? So it's, it's already is so it time to consider that seriously, or should we just wait for more data? More data? I can say that at least in the SF3B1 mutant population, the NCCN guidelines here in the US have already placed the Spattercept as category one recommendation for first-line therapy over ESAs. And then for groups that don't have the SF3B1 mutation, it remains ESA first. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Europe, uh, Pierre? Well, I, I mean, we, we have also to take into account some side effects of Fluspatacept. I mean, some patients describe uh, dizziness, you know, headache, some some fatigue, which may be different from that uh, associated with anemia. And I'm thinking in particular of one of my patients, you know, transfused every 15 weeks, uh, every 15 days, uh, every two weeks. And she was you know, uh, she had fatigue, she was tired just before the transfusions. And, and with Luspa, she was less transfused, but uh, experienced something she said was different. She said, I, I am, I, you know, uh, I have fatigue, but which is different from that uh, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, anemia. There's also dizziness, there's, a, you know, headache. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's probably about 20% of the patients at least. So uh, this is important because uh, EPO uh, is not... Well, it's generally not associated with with uh, side effects, and that's why cyclists, I mean, <laughs> champions, <laughs> use it quite quite a lot. <laughs> okay. No, otherwise, I, I, I mean, indeed, in, in, in cerebrastic anemia, it, it may it may you know uh, become first line. There's also a, a cost problem, of course. It's very expensive. 